Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. Glad that you're with us. If you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe and like. You can also follow us on Facebook and like us there and at Horse Racing Show on Twitter. And let's see, what else? Google Play and iTunes. Yes, all kinds of things. She is a rising star, or is really established now. She's all over the place at NBC, at TVG, an excellent analyst and reporter, and I'm proud to work with her. And she joins us now from California, Brittany Erton. Hello, Brittany. Kenny, you are far too kind. Thank you for having me. I'm glad that you're with us. Uh, because you're an interesting story. I mean, you, you've been, you've done acting and you've done modeling and you grew up around horse racing. Your father, Peter, an established trainer himself. And uh, all this kind of came together throughout your career. And then, boom, you know, you, you become this analyst that everybody wants to follow and keep up with. And uh, what's that ride been like? No pun intended. <laughs> Honestly, it's been quite surreal, to be honest, and a little surprising. I never imagined that I would end up in the horse racing industry, although I grew up in it. It wasn't on the radar for me for a very long time. Acting, film, television has always been in a massive passion of mine. But there's something about this industry that once you're in it, you just want to be a part of it. There's something truly remarkable and special about seeing these animals in the morning and how they progress. And, and I just fell in love with it. And it's, the rest is kind of history, I guess you would say. Did your, does your dad, Peter, does he still critique you or say, you know, that would have been a good question, Brittany, or have you thought about saying this in your report? Do you, do you even discuss that? <laughs> I'll be honest, I don't even know if he watches me most of the time. <laughs> what? What? Everybody watches you. I, I think that most of the time when I'm working, he's actually at the track, so he probably doesn't record TVG to, to see all of those shows. I know that he does record the NBC shows, and he'll sit down with my mom sometimes to watch them, but critique not so much to be honest I spend a lot of time asking him what kind of questions he think would be better it's always helpful to get someone's perspective that is an expert in the industry and give me a different way of looking at things and so from the very beginning I have been that annoying daughter that's constantly asked him questions uh, to try and get better oh uh, you're not annoying nobody ever say Brittany Ayrton's annoying he might say that <laughs> <laughs> What, what has been the most fun so far, uh, you know, in this uh, broadcasting career of yours? Are there a couple of moments that stand out for you? Uh, there's there's so many. Um, I will say that what tops the list for me recently would be something I shared with you, and that would be covering the Kentucky Derby and witnessing a Triple Crown. I yeah. was not on site for American Pharaoh's Triple Crown, but I know exactly where I was, and I'll never forget that moment watching it on my phone, um, him cross the wire as the as the video was buffering, but to actually be there and witness it in person and to be a part of the coverage, that was a really, really special moment for me and one of those that I needed to pinch myself a bit. Um, but prior to that, I, I owe everything to TVG for them giving me the opportunity to really learn as I, I think you learn more by actually going through the motions and experiences rather than maybe sitting and watching. So they've, they've allowed me the opportunity to really get to where I am today. Um, so I'd say beginning, one of my first interviews at Del Mar was pretty surreal. And then, of course, it's really been uh, capped off by an unbelievable triple crown and experience with NBC. And you've been all over the place already. You've covered uh, races in Europe. You've covered mm -hmm. races in Dubai as well as all over North America. What are the big, aside from the obvious about the turf racing and things in Europe, what, what's the whole feel of being at a big race, say, in, uh, in England as opposed to a big race in the States or being at the Dubai World Cup? Or are there, is there a thread that would link them all that we could understand? I'd say the pageantry and the partying probably is a big thread between the Breeders' Cup, the Dubai World Cup, and... Royal Ascot. There's something, though, that we could take away here in the States from what each country and jurisdiction does. When I had the opportunity to go to England for Royal Ascot, and it was my very first time going to work this past year, whereas in years prior, I've gone as a fan. And so to notice the difference of that, it, it was wonderful to see 
how much the country comes together for these five days worth of racing. And I can only imagine what it's like in Australia because Australia's racing is on the same level as our baseball or basketball. So it just seems to be a bigger deal in other countries than maybe it is here. And I hope that one day we can get uh, the love for racing in the States to be the same. That's a great point. And, and I'll ask as uh, someone that you cover the business, you obviously we talked about your father, Peter, being in the business. Uh, and, and people ask me, what do you think racing needs? I said, I think racing needs to have more fun overall. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't hurt to you. show that you're at a sporting event and you're having fun. There's some serious moments, but it can't always be uh, church-like. And I think sometimes yeah. it, it gets that feeling, in my opinion. I don't know. What do you think? No, I completely agree with you. And that's something that... I really enjoy about the Breeders' Cup because I do think that we showcase all of the fun people are having. And the same thing with the Triple Crown, but there are so many moments in between that I don't think the novice racing fans really know about. And I say with my friends, my friends know nothing about racing other than I cover it all the time and my dad's a trainer. But when I bring them out to the track, they wager, they go down to the paddock, they get all dressed up. And once they go for the first time, they want to keep coming. Yeah. So I think it's about making the races fun again and pretty much allowing people to know that it's there. If they know it's there, they go for the first time. It's like that bug that bites you and you have to keep coming back. That's, that's a great point. And let me, have you interviewed, how many times have you interviewed Peter after a race or before a race? My dad, Peter? Yeah. Um, I try to avoid interviewing him, to be honest. I don't want people to think that I'm playing favorite. So if it's an obvious choice in a race where he has a, a live horse that, you know, deserves me to ask him a few questions, then I will. But I think my favorite is interviewing him after a big win. Yeah. I can't help but get choked up. <laughs> I can, I can imagine. Well, actually, I was with you. Uh, when your dad won a big race, we weren't on site, but we were watching it. You remember in the in the NBC trailer? Was that right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we've had some times where I've been watching the races yeah. and his horses haven't quite got there. It was Belmont Stakes Day, Belmont and he Stakes had Day. Dark yeah. Vader running in the easygoer stakes and the horse he was on the inside and he was fighting. He finished third that day, but it, it honestly it felt like a win. Thanks for watching with me. <laughs> I remember that. I mean, I was excited about it, you know, it, it, because, you know, again, that's part of it. I think that's part of any sport when you mm -hmm. know somebody involved, even if you don't know them, obviously, you know, to work with you. And I've met your dad a couple of times. He doesn't know who I am, but I've met him a couple of times. Oh, he knows who you are. Uh, well, you know, I'd never assume, you know, that. And, and <laughs> but, but working with you and I remember old Czech and Lafitte were all in there and everybody's cheering. And, you know, because there is a rooting interest because we're rooting for you and rooting for your dad. So that was that was always a lot of fun. You know, and it's kind of an out of the out of body experience for me. Every time I'm rooting on my dad's horses, I forget that there's anybody around me, yeah. and I'm squawking like a bird. I mean, it's it's a little embarrassing. I hope nobody ever catches that on camera. Well, wait till this year when we have the camera. When I take the phone out when you're at the <laughs> yes, you know, put it up all there. over YouTube. Yeah, we'll YouTube that to death. I, I'm gonna, <laughs> your McDonald's commercial, right? Was it McDonald's? Oh my Yes. Wow. Throwback. Well, that was big. Deal. You know why? Because you're the only person I personally know who was in a McDonald's commercial. I've watched millions <laughs> of them. I've eaten millions of their burgers. I don't shouldn't say that because they're not sponsoring the show yet. We'll keep it open for Burger King and Wendy's, by the way, out there yes. if they want to sponsor. How about in and out. Throw that and, in and, and, and out. In and out. Oh yeah. If we can only get in and out out of California, I think they only go. They go to Texas, right? In and out goes to Texas. I know they're in Arizona and in Nevada. I think that's right. Well, they, I didn't even know they made the move to Texas. I thought it was only Nevada and California. Well, maybe it'll make it your way to Kentucky. I, I Much better I, I, than Shake Shack. I don't, yeah, I don't think they'll ever get here. But when I'm in L.A., hey, that's enough. Whenever you're in L.A., the cast and crew of the ra horse racing go to go to In-N-Out Burger. I wonder if we got any residuals on that, like you did for the McDonald's commercial. <laughs> because that was I a big... You're wearing your McDonald's uniform and the whole thing, right? It's a, no, it's a, so I was just supposed to be a customer, and yeah. we were eating. It was one of their new um, wraps with the fried chicken and, and lettuce and mayonnaise and the whole thing. Um, and I just had to eat and eat and eat and make it look delicious every time I had a bite. <laughs> and you did. That's acting. And I, That is acting. That is acting. Who knew that all my years spent uh, training – 
the Meisner technique and whatnot would result in a McDonald's commercial eating a fried chicken wrap. <laughs> what, what did did all that acting though? Did that help in the in the transition over to being on TV? I mean, it's all kind of a performance. We have to know things, and you know, people aren't writing lines for us when we're covering an event. Right. We're doing that ourselves, but still, it's it's a bit of a performance, I think. Absolutely. I, I think just being comfortable in front of the camera is the first thing. And I always felt as much as I loved acting, it was always difficult for me to delve into a character that was similar to myself. And I'm not quite sure why, because I was giving the, given these words and the character was very similar to I and I couldn't fall into it because they weren't my words. But for whatever reason, transitioning to broadcasting and actually being myself but not given those words has felt much easier to me. Um, I won't say that th this job is ever easy because it shouldn't be. You should be constantly learning and challenging yourself. But um, I think that just being comfortable in front of the camera was, was the biggest help. And of course, when and you, you know this, when you have a very small amount of time and you need to have your information get across to an audience in that short amount of time, you have to make sure that you have it. Well, for me, I memorize it. I write everything out and I memorize it. And I think that my acting classes 1000% have helped me do that because I can put together a 30 second piece, write it out and memorize it. And that's not as much of a struggle because of those acting classes. That makes sense. Brittany Erton, NBC and TVG analyst and reporter. We work together getting ready for the triple crown coming up. And so with that, Brittany, uh, who are some of the horses that you're keeping an eye on now, knowing that all things can change in the next eight weeks or so before the Derby? Oh, can't it ever. I mean, I think it would only have been about a week ago that Justify debuted yeah. and then he became the Triple Grail winner. So talk about things changing in a matter of a small amount of time. Um, I think it's pretty wide open this year. I don't think we've seen a horse on the track that would resemble an American Pharaoh or a Justify. Um, you know how it goes in this industry on the West Coast. Bob Baffer always has a loaded bench, and I think that that's no different this year. I cannot wait. I will say this for the San Felipe. That is gearing up to be an absolute battle of some of the best horses on the West Coast with game winner Improbable, who is mini justify in many, yeah. many opinion, just purely because of how he looks. And then Instagram for Jerry Hollendorfer. And those three alone, whew, clash of the titans. And that's one of the, I think that looks, it looks on paper to be one of the best San Felipe's in a long time. I always hate to say the best ever, but it's going to stack up with most of them. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And it's interesting because Javier Castellano flew out to work Instagram on Monday. And that's actually the second time that he's done that to try and find his derby mount. So he flew out to work Boltoro before Boltoro McKenzie um, clashed in the San Felipe. So that was a great race last year with the long inquiry and then the disqualification. And so I hopefully we get sunny skies because the weather hasn't been all that wonderful out here on the West Coast. Not yeah. complaining, it's much colder in Kentucky, I'm sure. <laughs> well, it, you know, it never rains in Southern California, but it pours. And I mean, that's, yes. it, and I guess it's needed and I know sometimes too much. So uh, that's why I never became a meteorologist. It's too much pressure. <laughs> but then again, I feel like they don't have that much weight on their shoulders because they can always be wrong. It's the weather, right? You, you know what? Let's just cut to the chase. What we do is much tougher than what they do, right? <laughs> We could go. Sure. We can say we can miss three horses. We could pick like seven out of ten races. But if the mm -hmm. three you don't pick are the Triple Crown on TV, if you miss, you just don't pick any of the horses that win. That's there it. You, you, go. you don't know anything. But we could say, as they did in Louisville this past Derby, well, there's a twenty percent chance of rain, and there was a twenty percent chance that it would never stop. Is what it turned out to be, as we know, mm -hmm. being right there drenched. See. They didn't take How about any. that weather that we trekked through on oh. Kentucky Derby and these horses and jockeys rode in? Yeah, yeah it's amazing. But again, the weather people missed it. It was supposed to be mm -hmm. a decent day, some rain, and, you know, it's going to clear up, but they didn't. They, they no, still have their jobs. Um, <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> I just lost the weather audience. All the weather people are flipping back to Weather Channel. <laughs> I understand. I'm watching Stephanie Abrams and Jim Cantori. I understand. I'm actually watching the news right now. They're saying that we've got a storm rolling in. I actually believe them now every time they say it. Well, you know, if you say it enough, sometimes you're going to hit. I mean, you know, I, it's like some of these handicapping shows. 
and I'm not knocking anybody, okay, because it's tough. And we know the favorite wins a third of the time, and it's tough. And you do a great mm-hmm. job handicapping. Uh, but, you know, there are a few. We won't mention them names, but you know some of them. They'll, they'll pick like six horses in the field of 10. They'll tell me that, you know, and I go, what? I, you know, I, I pick six out of, I get, give me six horses to pick and I might win this race out of 10. Well, how about when you and I were in Chicago for the Arlington Million and I could not for the life of me land on who I wanted to pick yeah. to win that race. And I think by the end of it all, I had picked seven different horses. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, sometimes a race shapes up like that. And to be honest, oh, yeah. if, if I could look back at that Arlington Million right now from this past year, I would probably pick five or six horses, again, to do it over. Who? I guess the only thing I was on grass to say Chad Brown. Of course, yes. again, that's going to encompass, what, like three, four horses in every big race, it seems, on the grass. Exactly, exactly. So you're not just, I mean, that's <laughs> at least seven horses between those two races, the Beverly D and the Arlington Million. But Eddie Olchek, he gave me such a hard time for that. <laughs> Well, you know, everybody wants to know your picks always. I imagine when you're walking around the track and the people see you on NBC and TVG, uh, and especially, you know, with what you do, they come up and say, who's going to win? They, they may even say that before they say, hi, Brittany. Hey, who's going to win? <laughs> it is kind of one of those in passing. Hey, who do you like here? And I'll be honest, I would never say, because my role at TVG and NBC as well, even though I do give selections here and there, is primarily as a host and reporter. So I in no way think that I'm on the level of some of the experts that we have at TVG or on the level of Eddie Olchek, who can hit the pick six and have a massive score win the betting challenge. So I do not put myself in that realm at all. I'm learning every day and handicapping is such a fine art in my opinion. Um, but yes, when, when you're out at the track, they, people just want, they want that winner. They want that score. I'll be on the set and we'll have guys coming up and Todd Shrupp will be on the desk with trainer Ron Ellis. And you've got them having a back and forth about why they like their horses. I, it's, I, I've always been a math lover and I feel like handicapping is such a math based yeah. science that I always find it interesting finding out how people land on certain horses or whatnot. But yep, when you're at the track, people always want, who's, who's the next winner? Give me a winner. <laughs> and pull the videotape as we stood side by side. We each picked Justify to win the Triple Crown at the Belmont. That we did. We weren't unanimous that day, were we? You know what? We were not unanimous. And, and that's why I take pride in saying it, because some people would say, well, you know, everybody was picking Justify at that time. No, they were not. But we did. There you go. I think we, we were maybe eighty percent of the crew, but it wasn't a hundred percent. Feather in our cap. <laughs> That's it, Brittany. It's been a pleasure catching up. Thank you for being on the show. Kenny, thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to seeing you hopefully soon. Every yes, time. we'll be there, Triple Crown, all the way through with the NBC crew and uh, uh, Brittany. It's great to see you. I hope to catch up with you maybe even before I see you in Louisville. Perfect. I look forward to it. Kenny, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Brittany Erton of NBC and TVG, analyst and reporter. Great insight as always. You are watching or listening to The Horse Racing Show. Remember to subscribe and like us on YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter at Horse Racing Show. Like us on Facebook. And you can listen to us on uh, your iPad out there, iTunes. And you can also listen to us on Google Play. We'll be back with more right after this.